Well, this evening on Talk Badminton, we're lucky enough to have Leslie Jewett on the line. How are you, Leslie? Very well, thanks, Martin. Nice yes, to be on. Yes, thank you. For, thank you for coming on. You've uh, and you've, so you've been catching up with a bit of the the other videos of the people that you, who did you play with in the past that I would know. Well, there's a few I've just only just clocked on there through Craig Robertson, but obviously Craig Robertson, Jim Mailer, Colin Leslie, done a bit of coaching did with you? him uh, in my, my current work capacity. Um, and I haven't really looked into many others. I, I did see Adam Hall. He would be a, a lot younger than yeah. me, um, but I know his sister well, so um, I'm sure I'll have to do a bit more um, delving in. But um, yeah, there was there's definitely a few former opponents there and, and teammates. Yeah, there's been some really interesting chat. I have to say between between most of them, as you said, uh, as you said offline, there's a I think that the lack of the ability to actually play it makes everybody very reminiscent of the past and all the things that's what certainly that's what that's what got me started with that actually was looking at you know why i loved it and why i started kind of reminiscing about why did i why did i get into badminton god i love badminton god i love it and then i thought everybody else must feel the same and i thought i'm just gonna start chatting to people i'm quite a sociable guy obviously so i just started chatting to friends and it's just kind of spiraled into everybody loves to yeah i mean it's yeah, it's an amazing sport isn't it Oh, definitely. It's, it's fantastic. It's um, well. I think the only thing during lockdown, you you really maybe you recognise that you've been doing it quite a few more years than you realise. I know. I know. Everybody's been the same. Jim Mailer hasn't played. You know, he's just got busted knees. But I think it just it definitely gives you in the spirit for it and makes you think. God, I used to love it. You know, I used to love it. The the rivalry you had Bruce Flocker on. Uh, was it last night? And that was great to hear his side of Jim's stories. You know, it was quite good. They've obviously had such rivalry over the years, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's some there's some big battles in the, the finals of the nationals. Yeah. So, what's your work? That's the, what do you do? So I'm working currently as a part-time um, Paralympic badminton coach for Ulster Badminton. Right. Um, which is obviously um, it's the only it's the only post in in Ireland. I would sort of oversee um, the players, you know, when they go to international competitions, etc. Right. So I've been doing that. I'm in my third year in that role. So where do you live? So I'm living in a little place called Moira in Northern Ireland. And uh-huh. um, it would be about um, ten fifteen minutes from the National Badminton Centre in Lisburn. Right. So we've got um, quite a quite a good centre down there. So we do most of the playing and sort of training from there. Fantastic! It's um, and you've been over there for a while. That, that, I think um, um, my mind's gone blank. Yeah, they were saying that you've well, been I, in. Uh, you're in Dunfrieshire as well. Did you say? Is that where you're from? I was. So, as a child, I was I was born in Lisburn. I moved to Scotland when I was nine, so I grew up in Dumfries from nine. So most of my badminton up to I moved back to um, Northern Ireland when I was twenty five. Yeah. So most of my playing was done in Scotland from the tender age of probably nine, ten of junior tournaments to sort of playing some Scottish under twenty threes. Um, and obviously the tournaments and some of these guys, obviously that you're you're you know you've already interviewed. Yeah. Um, so I've been back now. Obviously, I know you'll you'll come to a question later on. But I am forty eight. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a few it's a few years few years. Obviously, twenty three years back in uh, in Northern Ireland. And how fit do you keep? Yeah, I, I'm obviously doing quite a lot of coaching. Um, so although it's a part-time role in para badminton, I'm also working with a lot of um, sort of emerging junior players um, from a range of you know quite young ones, but all around that sort of teens, sort of teen group. Fantastic. Um, run a sort of junior badminton club with a, a former Irish ten times champion, Michael Watt. We've set up a junior badminton club wow. that's been sort of running for maybe six, seven years really? now. Um, so. Yeah, that's obviously it's, it, it's been sort of shut down, obviously with lockdown and everything. And um, but we've got a junior, we run the junior club, but there's a senior club there as well. But we set it up a few years back, um, and then obviously the National Badminton Centre, where I where I where I coach from, it, it's mostly coaching now. Most of my hitting on because I'm so much on court, most of my fitness is just from you know doing doing the badminton. And obviously during lockdown, I've done a bit more cycling. Yeah. Doing a little bit of running, the left hip's starting to yeah. 
just let me know I'm approaching 50. And what, and what kind <laughs> of coach do you think you are? Are you, are you quite, uh, what's your thinking on coaching? Are you quite a performance, quite a strong kind of athletic, kind of kind of very physical or are you very tactical or what do you think of that? Well, I, I think, I think depending on the players you're working with, you know, it, it takes a bit of everything. Um, whether that's, it's mostly one to one I'm doing. Good. But sometimes we'll be doing some one to two and also sort of, you know, some doubles work. Um, but I do, I do obviously do try and keep, do try and keep, um, I, I do a little bit of multi feet, yeah. but tend to do a lot more stuff with a running shuttle and try and keep it, try and keep it quite specific to um, the sort of player needs and their, what would say is a sort of, you know, I, I would have a profile in my mind of how I want them to yeah. play. And then I would try and just, you know, on a, on a week-to-week basis, try and always recap on some of the stuff that has we have been doing, but try and then add to that and try and improve that. Um, and also tr- trying to, you know, a lot of a lot of interaction with the player. Yeah. And each person's got a different style and a different issue or whatever it is and, and a different strength or a different weakness, I guess. I think that's well, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? It's There's no there's never two sessions the same or no two players the same. Uh, I think that's that's the real beauty of it. Um, every every session brings brings something slightly different, you know, to the to, to the horizon. But if I can still play a little bit, I still think um, if you can integrate the coaching into the actual play, yeah. then you get a feeling of how they're grasping it, you know, in, in a play situation. As opposed to a, a routine, can sometimes just be a little bit un un game like. Although you're although you're trying to tweak it as much as you yeah. can. And what is it? How competitive? You know, the the thinking of the junior club that you that you that you run. How competitive are, are they with one another? Um, it, it's, to be honest, it's it's still quite in its infancy. We've we've had some we've had some good juniors who have gone on to sort of representative level, you know, also mm-hmm. level. Um, but it, it's more it's more of a, it is more of a fun club. You know, they're, they're they're involved in some local leagues. Right. But it is a little bit more. We don't put as much pressure. We don't. Well, I'm not saying it's pressure. I do. I do. Do believe that something's got to be self-driven. Definitely. Um, but um, I do think that um, very much we we, we 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 encourage them, you know, to practice out with the club. But there's no, you know, no structure. You have to do this. I have to do that. Or anything. You know, it's very much. Up and the there. facilities around you readily available. Is it quite easy for them to get courts like that where you are? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's okay. It's obviously not the current situation. No, of difficult, course. But there are mm. there are a lot of church, obviously church, really? church homes. We've got quite a lot of new community centres, some new sports centres. Um, okay, it is. It is can be a challenge sometimes getting getting Barbican Court. Yeah. Um, but we're quite fortunate. Our club, you know, our club. There's been no problem. It's in a, it's in Guildford Community Centre, um, just outside Bambridge, and um, it has got. Um, we we use three courts, but there's four courts. But one of the courts has a has a climbing wall on it, so three three is actually ample for us with our, with our junior. Excuse club. my dog. <laughs> no problem. I've got four. I kept them down. Yeah, I kept mine. He, he won't leave me. He'll just be a pest if I don't ask him. But well, let's go with the question. It's okay. So, your full name, please. So my full name is William Leslie Jurt. Uh, um, and William Williams obviously was my grandfather on my mum's side um, my dad also had an uncle William as well so that's where the William comes from and it's quite a Northern Irish thing to have the sort of the, the first name and name is it? Be your middle name. is that right? yeah that's a common thing in Northern Ireland is it? well I've never heard of that common like, uh, it's been common <laughs> I often wonder why it happens I know I'm thinking to myself why doesn't nobody call you William? Yeah. Yeah, especially when, you've been, especially when you've been in Scotland. Especially when you've been in Scotland. I mean, that's a banker, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Willie, come on, Willie, you're on. So uh, you're uh, good, and you're age forty-eight. You said forty-eight. Yeah, that's good. You obviously keep fed. You run and stuff as well. Did you say cycling? Did you say? Yeah, cycling, running. Done a couple of marathons. Oh, yeah. Well, I lost my father in 2015 um, to run the London Marathon. 2016, raised some Brilliant. funds um, for AJ and I, who he had a little bit of dementia. Yeah. 
Um, so I've done the London Marathon. I've done Dublin 2013. Done uh, London 2016. Well, um, that was probably that's probably as much as the, <laughs> the longer distance stuff I'm going to do now. And do you still do you still uh, run a distance when you go out for runs? Do you run at all? I know. Uh, yeah, I'm doing some intervals. Do doing some intervals on grass now at the park, yeah. just in lockdown. So we just uh, mix it up, you know, a bit of you know two hundreds, some four hundreds, and um, some time stuff. Just really mix it up. It's not. It's not following any sort of plan. It it's more just to get out in the fresh air and just get some, you know, keep the body. And is it, is it just yourself, Leslie, as well, or do you go out with somebody else? Are you in a, a, do you have a... Oh, I have, have, have someone that I meet, you know, my one person that I'm Brilliant. allowed to meet. So, uh, yeah. So, no, it's, yeah, it's been, it's, been, it's been good. It's been good. It's, it breaks up a bit of the monotony of the, the amount of time in, in the house. Oh, for sure. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's brutal. I haven't left the house since well. I feel like it's. I feel like the windows are boarded in. It's been since last March. All England was the last time I was out properly. Um, I was at the All England on the tenth of March to the fifteenth, and then I wasn't allowed back in the office after that because they were scared, and then the office never reopened. So tenth of March was my. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. So where's your home area? So my home area is Moira. That's that's where I live. And that's how you ended up back there. So, t so yeah. tell me, but tell me about that. How did you end up? When when did you go to Scotland? To explain that to me again, would you? So when I was um, nineteen eighty one, my father got a job promotion. Um, if we hadn't moved, um, his job we'd probably seen him every sort of six to seven to eight weeks. Yeah, really. He was a sales. He was a sales rep um, for a company called Unipart. So that's uh, a big company. Yeah, it's a car parts company, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, they, we, he covered the north of England, Scotland, Isle of Man and Northern mm. Ireland, but most of his work was obviously Scotland, north of England. So we made the decision, um, obviously a family decision, to move. So Dumfries was Dumfries was a good place because of on the border with you know both England and Scotland. Yeah, for geogra geography, uh, for, for his area, his territory, I guess. Wow, well, mm -hmm. and you—that's when you and you were nine, you were nine at that point. And when, and when did you start playing? So my first ever a little bit of fun babbling was in Northern Ireland, just in the garden with a, a an old. I called him Uncle Sam, but he got me sort of cheap set of rackets. You know these ones you get. In the yeah, market, I love that. Rackets, yeah, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> um, we used to play over a piece of string in the garden, <laughs> and um, then basically I. Uh, a junior badminton club in our church hall in Hillsborough. Um, and I would play there about seven, about seven year old. I was also playing tennis at the time in Downshire Tennis Club in, in, in Hillsborough. To be honest with you, probably <laughs> if I look back, I wanted to be a Beyond Borg as a child. I just love Beyond Borg at the time. Um, moved to Scotland, tennis wasn't as, wasn't as accessible. No. Um, so we we joined um, local badminton club uh, in Dumfries YMCA. It was a two court complex, and Anne Gibson, obviously Anne Roberts, yes. um, first Scottish Olympian, Anne was played at that really? club, and there was a number of a number of amazing players. Um, the late uh, Mary McCown and David McCown ran that club, and there was maybe between maybe seventy to eighty juniors it was twice a week. What was that club called? These it's Dumfries YM. Oh really? Wow. Yep. And does that still go? I don't believe it does. Wow. I don't think so. Um, but oh, there was many there was many junior internationals came out of, came out of that club. Really? Uh, so yeah. Uh, I look back, you know, a lot of a lot of players that went on sort of junior national levels. Young Graham Simpson, who obviously got a, got a bronze at the Commie Games in um, in Manchester, um, he would have been younger than me, but he came through through that sort of structure. And a lot of other players, you know, Marie Cochran, there was Mary Ferguson, Vary Smith, um, Derek Bell, Natasha Murray, or Natasha Gilmore now, David Gilmore's yeah. wife, um, all all good players. But a lot of those guys then would have graduated from Dumfries YMCA to another like a regional club or squad, which um, Mitch Murray, a former national under-21 champion, and Mitch was her coach, and also then Jim Thompson, who um, was coach to Anne um, as well. So, uh, and we would have we 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 together a lot in, in Lockerbie, oh, really? and also at 
also in um, and where they came up to up to there was a new Barman Sports Hall built in um, at the David Keswick Athletic Centre in Dumfries and it was a five quarter that was built in my third year at secondary school really? which was a big big bonus for my Barman as well so when you when you think back to your Barman who do you have a person that you attribute your um, passion and determination and love for the sport too initially Initially, initially, definitely, um, it would have to be Mitch Murray. You know, as he was the he was the coach really that, that put all the what would look now the the corners the corners the the fundamental the foundation the rocks that are um, you, you need. Um, and I mean, he was a, he's a fantastic player um, and a fantastic coach. But he made it fun, I guess. At yeah. that age, he's got to be fun as well, right? Absolutely, but I think at that stage we knew we knew it was only certain players got invited into that sort of academy. There was it was a, the old um, was called it was a drill hall, but it was called the Lorburn Hall. It used to host the the South West Open many years ago. Eddie Chung won won it many years back, um, but that was an old drill hall. But absolutely fantastic to play in. Um, a lot of people would have raved about the Lorburn Hall, how good it was. Really? Um, but basically, um, the Lorburn Hall in Dumfries would have it would have been sort of used for concerts and things as well. But that situation on a we went on a Wednesday night. There was two courts for juniors. There was a centre court which Anne done most of her practice on. If you're a good enough junior, we got in, in, invited up to play a match against that. Mm. And there was court four and five. All the the best senior players locally were also playing doubles. Um, so when you sort of made, if you were good enough and made your grades, you would get invited up at times. Wow! Um, but it was also down a lot to how well you actually practiced and, and done all your sequences. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? And what age? Obviously, you were very young when you started. What age did it become something that you loved? That you loved, kind of thing, and you thought, "I just, I can't get enough of this." What, do you remember that feeling? Yeah, I mean, one thing always sticks in my mind. Uh, the first junior tournament I went to at the Magnum Leisure Centre, I was, I was I think it was 10 at the time, it was under 12, but I remember Craig Roberts and David Gilmore, they didn't win it, but they were at the tournament, Gillian Holday, and also a guy called David Wallace won it. Um, but that tournament, um, I got very heavily beaten by a good guy from Lanarkshire. <laughs> I think it was something like 15-1, 15 <laughs> And I said to my father when I come home, um, the tournament, um, someday I'll beat, I'll beat that player. Really? And it actually took six, it took me six years, and I remember actually beating him in three sets at Glen Rothes at the Brand Rex really? um, under fifteen. Tournament. So <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was quite, I was quite driven. You know, I think. Will you give me some time to think? When I think back, I mean, I was playing, I was playing nearly every day. That's, that's the question. Yeah. Structure, it was just a, it wasn't a structure, but it was, you know, playing at a lot of senior clubs. Um, there used to be a rule that they didn't allow you into senior clubs till you were either 16 or 18. But once one club let, changed their policy to let me in at 14, uh, there was a few other clubs let me let me join. Yeah. Um, so I had a, I was fantastic. Just had so many senior players to to spar against and practice with. And my father, my father was fantastic about, um, you know, he just he took me wherever, you know. I used to remember well, my mum said send me up home upstairs to do my homework, and I just I couldn't wait to get my tracksuit and just get out to Balvin. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And did you? Um, and how did you get on at school and that kind of thing? Then what did you think of that when you were at school? Were you, you know, did did you have a? Don't know what you do for what you did for a career. Did you ever do anything outside of Balvin? Were you always in Balvin? No. Leslie. Um, well, I was really, I was really keen on football at school. So, as the captain of our primary school, we won the, um, we won the regional six sides, um, Dumfries and Galway six and six sides. So, as the captain of that, I actually split my head at school and missed the trials for the Dumfries and Galway regionals um, football at primary school, and um, I was never considered again. <laughs> so, um, I, I made a decision when I got to secondary school. My father sort of said, "Look, what you're going to do is it football or badminton." And I just said, "Look, really? I'm going to go with the badminton." What age was that? Sorry, so, Leslie. That was um, that was early second secondary, so probably second year. So was that like fourteen something? School. Yeah, thirteen, fourteen. Wow. I'd already I'd already played I'd already played at sort of under thirteen level um, for Scotland under thirteen uh, quad quadrangular. Mm. Uh, oh yeah. I had made the eight, made the eight. And the individuals for that, and then in under fourteen, and I made the four the next year. 
Um, but I, I, you know, I, in my own mind, although I did love football, um, I look back at that sometimes and go, you know, should I maybe have stuck at it a bit longer? But um, I think just sometimes you, the amount I was playing to to split it, I definitely the level that looking back now, the level of junior badminton in Scotland. Um, if I had been doing two sports, it definitely would have been it would have been challenging. More challenging. So, did you know after you know school at that school age, and then leaving school, you played all those all that all the time? And so, did you know that you were going to do it for work, or what did you, what happened with that? It was interesting. I got sat, sat down with my counsellor at school, and good. Uh, this is interesting. And I said, I want to be a leisure centre attendant, and he says, Why is that? I just said, So I can get get free badminton courts. I come in before work, get courts to train on. And he said, have you ever thought about going to study sport? He says, because, you know, your grades are good enough if you, if, you, if you stick in. And he told me about, um, you know, my options. And I really took a shine in to, to come to, to Jordan Hill, which then becomes Strathclyde right. Uni. And um, shortly after, I'm under 18, Stephen Badley retired as European champion and took the national coach's job in Scotland. And he very much encouraged me to come to Glasgow, and I actually got to spar sometimes with him um, at lunch in my lunch breaks from uni. Um, and I, you know, no, no, no regrets at all. It was very, very handy for the Coburn Centre. There was no, no, obviously Scotston Babbin Academy yeah. then, and um, that was further down the line. Um, and then, yeah, so just really followed, followed my heart followed my heart with the badminton and always wanted to have you know, to have the dual role of working in sport and trying to do my sport as best as I could. Didn't I didn't see a career in it. I didn't there wasn't the same sort of money available in terms no. of you know lottery and everything there is now. Um, but just to always said, you know, I'll do I'll do what I, I don't can. think there's a lot I don't think there's a lot of money now. I just think you can get by. Didn't you? It's not like yeah. it's not something where oh great, look at the money there is now, but there is just money. <laughs> Anything, frankly, yeah. that will pay your way, I think, is a luxury compared to how it was. You know, you either took a decision and somebody says to you, don't be so stupid, get a proper job and, and play about n a nights and weekends as much as you can and want. Um, but, but, yeah, n now we have the, the luxury and that's certainly the the academy, it sounds, yeah, it's, it's uh, as you say, the... The facilities now are quite incredible, aren't they? I was talking to talking to Craig about the facility they've got there. Sounds really impressive, really good. Well, ninety seven, ninety seven. I, when I finished working, so I worked as racket sports coordinator for Glasgow City Council. We hosted the World Championships in Scotstoun Leisure Centre, but then obviously the Scotstoun Balvin Academy evolved. Then shortly after, I left obviously Glasgow City Council to move back to Northern Ireland. Um, but everything, you know, the the programs that are running in the you know the Kelvin Hall. I mean, I. I I'd done some work overseeing some of the squads that Alison and Fulton took, Tommy Hepburn, um, Susan Hughes was a young, yeah. you know, 13, 14 year old Alistair Casey, yeah. some of those, um, you know, former Scottish internationals. Um, and you just, I just look back on it now, and it was, there was some fantastic stuff, and it's really, it's really moved forward, you know. So it's, it's great, great to see, great to see Scotland doing so well. The three, two, they're close. Close match with Denmark. At yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, follow it closely. Great guys. Great, great team. I have to say, um, so for sure. So, how did you end up going back to Ireland? So yes, um, just followed. Met someone. Met someone. And oh dear, women! I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> the dual, the dual, the dual, rule, dual rule never left my, in my mind. Though to be honest with you, I always knew, always knew that there was the potential because being born in Northern Ireland, yeah. that there could be potential for Commonwealth, yeah. for Commonwealth Games representation. Because it was harder to get on the Scotland team. I mean, number this, this number of the singles players. I was maybe in the my, probably my best rank was maybe eight or eight or ten in the in the men's in the men's. And you had people like, you know, Kenny Miller, was Bruce Flocker, Jim Miller, David Gilmore, Craig Damn, Robertson. Yeah. You know, you could list it was a, there was a there was a depth of, you know, strong players. You had the like Gala McMillan, Dan was sort of coming to the end his playing. Um, but there was a lot of it was it was a strong Brilliant. strong depth. I mean, Paul, Paul Hume was still playing a bit. You had Sandy Paisley, um, and, and and other younger other younger players as well. Um and it was it was I mean it was I always sort of thought, you know, I would love to go to the Commonwealth Games, and that would give me a sort of a bit of an appetite to to come back here, 
um, play play tournaments, yeah. and thankfully I, I made it. I made it to nine, made it ninety eight to to KL and played number one for Northern Ireland yeah. in KL. And, and cool. equally nice because a lot of my mates from Scotland were, were representing Scotland. I think uh, Jim, Jim, Bruce and Davey were singles and then Craig, Gary and I think Kerry and Russell were, were playing the doubles for Scotland there. And obviously Gibby, oh, Ann Robertson now, Gibby was out there as well. And one of my teammates, um, Sandra Watt, got a, got a medal oh, yeah. in, the, in the women's doubles. So um, it, it was a bit, a bit of a duo. Um, out there representing, but also getting to, to support some of my former Yeah, former, how, how amazing. How fantastic. And sounds like you uh, And what's your, your club badminton like in Ireland? Is it good where you are? Is, that, is it... Do you still yeah, play club okay. badminton? Do you, score, are you, quite, you, still, do you still enjoy just, it? Just, just back a little bit to club badminton um, with a few changes, just with something else I was involved in. Uh, I've been able to get back to down to Alpha to the National Badminton Centre. We have a um, senior senior club on a Tuesday night nice. down there. So people like Graham Henderson, Eugene McKenna, some names you might remember. Mm. Some of those guys had a few shots with those. So guys I've obviously coached, worked with, played with in the past. So um, now actually working with some of their children as well, which is it's fantastic coaching some of them. So um, yeah, it's um, it, it's good. It's good, and 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 it is. It, I suppose the brain always thinks you can you can do what you used to be able to do, but it um, it, it definitely. Can't, do you still you know? love singles? Oh, I still I still do love you? the I still love the physicality of of do that. You? No one no one to blame but yourself. Yeah, and that's what you sprint for. That's why you're out sprinting, right? Well, it's just I just generally I've always enjoyed I've always enjoyed the physical that side of it. You know, just the, the health the healthy part of it as well. Were you ever involved? Did uh, you ever see Andy Cook? Did you ever go and see him in Grangeman? Oh yeah, Andy. My father, my father took me up to Andy's regularly from the really? place, uh, and obviously with Mitch. But my coaching was supplemented really with um, trips to Grangemouth. Um, up to up to the leisure centre there, and uh, yeah, we, I would still be in regular contact with Andy. Yeah. And what do you think you learned from? What do you think you learned from these different people compared to you know when you're being coached by one person? What do you think you learned from Andy that was different? Do you think there was was there different things, or what do you think of that? Yeah, at a young age, I just we 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 talk, we talked a we talked a lot. You know, the other the other sessions probably would have been just you come in for the session. And it's very much all about the badminton, whereas at Grangemouth, we'd have done the session, we'd maybe have a coffee afterwards, we'd have a chat, we'd sit, talk about other things. Um, but definitely when I was younger, it was a lot of, a lot of the, 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 much more of the, the multi-shuttle, which I'd never really done, but at a young age, um, a lot of, a lot of multi-shuttle and things I'd never seen before, but all linked to the, you know, the physicality of the game yeah. as well. And that was, that was quite exciting when you'd been doing more, Running, running shuttles. I mean, there's no right or wrong way to coach. There's just it's about finding the That's balance right. between what. You but I think you've got to mix it up. I had a conversation with Sam, with uh, Josh McGee about coaching and kind of different coaches and how he was talking about his coach that he has at the moment, and his he was just talking about um, different coaches coming in. I just posed the question to him whether. You know, how do you think they learn? You know, when you've had the same coach for five years and you go every single week, how do you think that they know what when you walk in and say, right, we're going to do X, Y, and Z? How do you think they know? How do you think they learn? You know, and he was quite. He said, oh, to be honest with you, I hadn't really thought about that. But I suppose you do learn from different people, and you might pick up something from even now. Probably you might think back when you're coaching other people to, oh, yeah, Andy used to do that, or somebody else might have done that, and everybody's got a different, different thing. Absolutely. I mean, I just think, you know, even watching, you know, just even watching sometimes, um, yeah. you know, uh, you know, different, different styles, different, different how people react to things. Um, and also, you know, also know when to change, you know, uh, I don't see the concentration level just as much at the moment. So it's maybe I'll maybe just mix this yeah. up, you know, maybe, maybe a bit like, you know, a little bit of time just to chat. Yeah. 
you know, and then and, and back back into it again. Isn't it interesting that when you think of the technology and the fe- the technology now of YouTube and being able to see you know elite players online and and you imagine being an elite player now where you're going to these tournaments and the analysis that you could do of your opponents with the internet, you know, you could really look at every match and look for weaknesses in every direction uh, and uh, on the internet, right? And you think back to when you played and that kind of thing, you could you couldn't do that. You know, you'd have to go and watch. You'd sit by the side of the court and watch him play and say, look, he's not great over there or he's not great over there. Or, he's not good at getting over there. Where, you know, nowadays, so simple, right? It just, you know, if, you, if you're if you coming up to playing an opposite, a, a, pers- a certain individual, you know, it's an absolute doddle to re- research, really. There's nowhere to hide, you know? Absolutely. And now it calls on both, you know, both players have got to, They've got to, you know, be able to counter, but also they've got to do their homework too. Yeah, that's so. amazing. Sorry, let's go back to the questions. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got one older brother. He's five years older than me. And did he play at all? He did. He won the Ulster schools in, in primary school. Really? Believe it or not, he, Michael Watt's mother taught him really? at primary school and she ran the badminton club. Um, and um, Gary, that was actually motivation as a child when I seen him bringing his couple of medals home. I wanted to have more yeah. medals my Yeah, it's, and did they ever play against him? Um, we probably, we probably did. We probably did when I was quite young, the Dumfries YMCA. But uh, I suppose that as we as we got older, there was probably quite an intense rivalry. Good. But there was always a. The, the five years older, the, the power and the strength was massive. But I always used, to, always used to get stuck in goals for football with his mates. That was the only reason I got to play football with him. It's definitely, it definitely toughened me. I mean, I got blacked in the face so many times. Leather, leather footballs, you know. But uh, that's that's that, that, that that's a bad look. Isn't it? <laughs> that's good, isn't it? So he's driven you on, isn't it? Isn't that a See, in the background, he's, I mean, my elder brother was probably my motivation. I said that in my interview, my next elder brother, I've got three elder brothers, but my next eldest, I've always had been like that with him. I've always had a big rivalry and it's definitely helped me with singles and I wanted to beat him. And then my next elder brother wanted to beat him. So that was certainly a motivation for singles for me at the time. Um, so where did you start playing? So it was Dumfries really, I know you started in Ulster, but it was Dumfries really, wasn't it? Dumfries. Dumfries was definitely the start of it. That was my first yeah. junior tournament and things. For, you know, when I went up to Irvine and then from there it just snowballed. You know, went to Largs, yeah. won, the, won the primary schools, Dumfries Gallery primary schools, and then I got the invitation to the, the top 16 boys and girls from across Scotland yeah. and then Largs for, for five days. And it was it was inspirational. I mean, Alistair Morgan come, showed us a video of Dan and Billy and the family all England against the Siddick brothers and never forget that stuff. I mean, that's just, that was inspiring. John Williamson was the well, one of the coaches. John Williamson, Alan Thompson, Murray Carr, and um, Doogie Walker, I think, were the four coaches um, yeah. at, at Largs and Gary. At Largs. Yeah. So, so was that the residential course, Leslie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, my dream. I never got to do that. I always wanted to do that. Yes, yeah, so that was primary. So that 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 really that shaped that shaped my summer for probably up to under fifteen. I was at Largs each summer for five days um, at those different um, you know thirty yeah. years, which was amazing. A big, big social, but you know training, eating, sleeping, babbling every day, and that was my dream at that age. That I wanted to do that in England. When I, I'm from the northeast in England, there was I can't remember where I was. I was talking to somebody about it. I can't remember exactly where it was, but there was one. I'm sure there was Nottingham way. There was. I'm sure there was a facility that way. The residential badminton course. I think my brother went to it, but I never got to go. And I was uh, oh, I would have loved that. That was my dream. I suppose I loved singles, and uh, yeah. Um, do you remember your first racket? Yeah, my first racket. My, my brother actually bought it one off of, off of one of his mates for me. It was a Grays. I don't know. I can't remember anything more about it. But it was a metal shafted racket, metal alloy head. Um, but it was a Grays racket. Quite Manti, Manti had Manti had given him a, an ascot with a you know a wooden one with a head press. But he actually bought me this Grays one. A wooden racket with a oh my goodness, like a flower press. You know the flower presses used to. It was an, it, well, it was my auntie's. It was an ascot. It was, was an it? ascot with a with a press on it. You know what I mean? So oh. I'm glad I didn't. I, I would have probably had a stronger smash if I'd have used that wooden racket. <laughs> uh, what was the what was your game? What was your what was your strength? Do you think when you played singles? 
Um, was it your fitness and being able to run your opponent down, or was it a smash, or was it what? A bit of, I think a bit of fitness, fitness, and I was, I was quite, I was quite quick, so probably fitness and speed. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Main things. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? And do you, 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 you drill that into people that you're coaching now? Do you think? Are you involved with disability badminton now? Do you say? Is yeah, that right? Yeah. Well, I think I think always I think always you know as I said earlier about that you know looking at a player's attributes you know you've got to look at all the you know the, the speed strength all the technical and then obviously the you know the the actual the thinking the reading the game and um you know it yes. all, it's all it's all part and parcel you know and maybe depending on the player some of the things might actually be you might have to just put, ramp ramp it up a little bit more in certain things depending on you know how they're progressing. Yeah. I, I'm I'm really fascinated with uh, dis- disability badminton and how um, just I just think it's an incredible thing to be honest with you. It's taken me a long time to mature on the subject, but I th- really think it's an absolute incredible thing that you know the people t- uh, you know with the, the most incredible disabilities that people can you know and, and to coach it and to find right to do you know with this type of disability you need to do that and you know you're not going to be able to do this but you'll be able to do that and so focus on that is that is that is that how you learn you know because there's such a variety of disabilities that's what always amazes me about it you know yeah i mean i think you know it's, it's again i like i like what you said there's obviously you know the court dimensions are slightly different depending on the the classification is it in, is it sorry i didn't know that is that right yeah yeah so you'll have some players, you know, a full court, some are a half court. Really? Um, so obviously, you know, again, the sim- similar thing is strength and weaknesses can come from, you know, from the the what what their particular weaknesses are. Yes. You know, with with their disability. That's so, right. And again, again, you just you just learn you learn how to you know in terms of how you structure your coaching. Um, and uh, I mean, you're right. The journey, the three-year journey, has been incredible. Um, you know, and, meet, and meeting so many people across the world and to get into the Paralympics now. As well, I know, obviously, Lyndon was on, but to get into the Paralympics now for badminton, and um, well, it's, it's to showcase it. Um, but it's obviously, you know, it's only it's only a small ninety-two players um, across it- across the, across the six classifications. It- so it's it's very very it's very very tight. Um, um, tight to to make it and uh, to qualify. Yeah. So, um, I, just, I, just, I just think it's just think it's incredible. And it, it must be difficult. It must be very difficult to coach, um, and it must be very difficult to put people against one another unless they have very similar disabilities. Um, but yeah, just incredible. I think. I mean, the way the way ahead. The way ahead is you know, is integration. You know, in, into able-bodied clubs. Yes. You know that's the way to go. But then that's, I mean, it's like you and I you know in the past of when you're, you know, trying to break, trying to break the regime of, you know, but technically, uh, you know, four players who are always on the team, uh, and then you know to actually get to integrate people into their club because people are, you know, people basically are quite set in their way. Definitely. So mm-hmm. That's what we hope we hope to do is you know get get more full integration. Yeah. Um, in my club where I am, there's a there's a wheelchair player who was in his early forties, a phenomenal player, um, and uh, yeah, he died so suddenly died. He was totally able bodies, incredible reach, big, long, really strong, but early forties, really strong, long arms, strong. You know the the strength, the wheelchair, and the movement around the court was just phenomenal. But yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, so he was at the club every week, and that was fine. Yeah. It's uh, incredible. It's just incredible to watch. To be honest with you, I think the best way. I think the best way to, to probably to demonstrate it is actually to put an able-bodied person into a wheelchair and say, "Right now, play badminton." And I think all of a sudden you'd have a huge respect, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, so the name of your first club, that was the you told me that Dumfries YMCA was it? Yeah, Dumfries YMCA in 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 Scotland. Yeah. What was the one in Ireland? Is uh, sorry, in Ulster. Hillsborough, Hillsborough Hills. Presbyterian Church, Junior Badminton Club. Cool. And who was your first coach? That's a that's a good question because uh, it's really you know what how you, would you call that coach? And I would actually say Mitch was Mitch Murray, as I said earlier. Yeah, Mitch Murray was. Tell me, did, you, did, did, did either of your parents play? Uh, my father. 
said he played a little bit, but I think it was just maybe a few club sessions, but not very much. It wasn't an my influence, mom, it wasn't... Uh, my mum played later, actually later she... in life in Dumfries, but it was really just, you know, it's very much social, just with some of her friends. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? I think it's amazing for that, for badminton, to be honest with you. Um, do you remember the first shuttles you used? I, I do remember there were there were Carlton tournament. It was like the heavy plastic. Yes. You know, not got the cork on it, but the actual solid plastic. That was the first one we hit in the um, in the the, the, the church junior badminton club. To Mitch, uh, your first ever tournament and trophy. The first badminton trophy would have been the would have been the primary schools. Um, in Dumfries, that would have been in P6, so we'd have been probably 10 at the time. And was it quite a big thing, like when you're at school and stuff, was there a lot of people from your class and that kind of thing going to Babington? And how many times a week did you go to the, to, to that? So at, at primary school, we had a club in her. We had a little club in, in the primary school with a one-court hall. Yeah. Uh, it was quite low ceiling. Yeah, but yeah. We, had a, we had a primary school in our league matches against the other primary schools in Dumfries. And I think it was, if I remember rightly, I think it was, you know, four boys, four girls on the team. So good. Um, and, yeah, so, yeah, we had that. And then we had our, we had the regional, Dumfries and Galway Regional Primary School tournament, which he also qualified for Perth to get through to Perth to the finals. Yeah. Up at the Bell Centre. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, yeah, so that was, that was, that was the primary school, Babbitt. But probably back then, at primary school, I was... I was doing the probably the, I had the primary school um, primary school club, and then I had the YMCA Tuesdays Saturdays, and with the, and with the YMCA badminton club was basically a, it was a board with a ten minute you got a ten minute match, was it? And you were so you know seventy to eighty players. Yeah, uh, really. And you, had, you had two court two courts, but it was a it was a it was a big youth club as well. So there was a pool table. There was some arcade machines you you could get ice cream you could watch the tv table tennis there's other bits and pieces to do so you just that was your that was your tuesdays your tuesdays you had two or three hours on the tuesday two or three hours on the saturday and that was your that was your babble and at time. the same time there was 70 people in the hall well 70 people in the center um My God. but you would have had the balcony you'd had the balcony behind the two court hall so you'd maybe had Maybe fifteen, maybe fifteen to twenty people watching. You know the the two courts with obviously it was all doubles or half courts played. So you obviously had eight people on, and then everyone else was either watching or actually you know socialising in the in the the centre. And you, sorry, what was the thing about the ten minutes? So that was the match. So the board was made up with your games. So say on the clock, it was 7 o'clock, you're going to be on at 10 past 7. No. The board was made up, so you can see 7, 10 past 7, no. 20 past 7, half past 7. So you can see, and you you need to be back there for half 7. So if you're watching the TV at 25 no. past 7, you'd be looking no. at the clock and going, right, I'm going to be in, I'm going to be ready, I've got to be in. And you didn't want you didn't want um, Mrs. McCowan to call, have to call you. <laughs> you know, you were basically had to be in there for your game ready to go at half 7. You should have said, "Where is, where is Leslie?" Oh, he's on Space Invaders. No, I, there was no. I wasn't on Space Invaders, but um, I was probably quite good that way. But I do remember some players, you know, being late sometimes, or they'd maybe just got an ice cream drink or something, hadn't finished it. And what about the score? What about the, the score in the kept, game you're on? Well, you kept, you kept, the, you kept, the, you kept the score. You know, you kept the score on the match. So if you only if it, at ten minutes, if it was, it was. 12-8, that was just your score. And then the next match, you went back to zero again. Play it again. And against some, so against somebody have, different. Have against somebody different, okay. Leslie. Somebody different. You, you'd, have, you'd have had a mixture of primary, secondary. So it, you could be sort of graded. You know, you generally might be playing against some of your friends or sometimes you might be, you know, stuck up. Oh, I'll get to play with a senior player. You know, you're at the front court. They're they're covering the back. Generally, it would have been it would have been sort of you'd have been graded with someone more more your own standard. Wow, isn't that amazing? I've never heard of that system before. So, and the games were organised. You'd seen the the who was it organised? Did you say? 
So Mrs. McCown Mrs. would organise. She would have just she would have made up this this chalkboard, you know, with you know two courts, one court, two courts, and then there would have been just a three or four courts. We could see ahead of yourself. Sounds like golf. It's like golf tea time. Yeah, that's that, it's very very similar really to that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, do you remember your first to your first tournament? You said sorry, Dumfries. Is that right? Do you get a trophy? Have you still got it? I've still got I've got a box with all my medals and all my trophies uh, up in the loft. You still have the first one. I've still got I've still got them all. Still got them Get all. It I, I, do remember, I do remember as a youngster, like actually loving when the tournament organisers put out the trophies. Go, oh, I'd love to win that. Yeah. I'd love to win that oh, single yeah. trophy. You know, <laughs> yeah, the single trophies always seem to be the biggest and the best. You know yeah. what I mean? So I remember the little marble base with the plastic gold <laughs> thing with the little babbin in the middle. That's what I remember. And they got engraved in the middle. I'm thinking, what oh, serious? But I've got some of them. I don't know where they are. Um, your singles or yeah. When did you start doubles no, and things? I'm sure, no, I always, always played, always played all the events. Um, and actually, I'd never my, my my three national titles at sixteen, eighteen, and twenty one. My first Scottish um, title was at mixed doubles at under sixteen. Then then boys doubles under eighteen, and also boys doubles under twenty one. I didn't win any singles titles. Um, I had a few runners ups, but um, I didn't win any national titles right. or singles. But they still. Still, singles was my was the dream. Was my, was my, that was, was your my go to. That was your dream, yeah. Oh, uh, that's uh, yeah, really good. Um, and so, your main competition would you say growing? I think I'm going to leave it at this one because we've been on for quite a while, and I know you probably want to get your tea. Um, what was your? Who was your main competition growing up? So my main competition, my age group would have been Barry Kinnaird um, from Perth, Perth and Kinross. Uh, but him and I won the doubles at eighteen and under, under really? eighteen under twenty one. Did you? Um, but there was another guy, Graham Clucky, who would also been very very good. Um, he would have won the under sixteen nationals. I think he beat Barry in the final that year. Um, and then he sort of he went into doc. He went on to be a doctor. Um, he was quite an early mature. Um, I think I I I beat him then sort of in that under seventeen sort of that sixteen. At sort of sixteen, as I just started to grow, um, had a few had a few a few sort of good results from that sort of about fifteen sixteen year old. Um, had started to get a little bit of a breakthrough of results against slightly older, you know, up the age groups. Whereas before, I was doing quite well in my age group, but they started to then win a few more uh, matches against older players. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was a lot, a lot to do with the, the you know we talk about the bio, biological maturity just growing. You know, some people grow faster. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm getting stronger, yeah, for sure. Um, well, that's good. I'll just, I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to jump these questions. I'll come back to you again if that's okay. We'll have to speak again. I've really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, it's been good. No problem. It's, it's great to see this and uh, keep, keep, keep enjoying all the stuff during lockdown. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you just the one last passing uh, closing question. I suppose what is it about badminton over other sports? Obviously, you had football and um, other things, running and things like that. What is it? Do you think that stuck? to badminton for you and what even now what do you think about badminton as a sport compared to other sports yeah just I think the, the friends I think the lifelong friends that I made just really genuine friends um, it was you know regardless of you know that group of people it was always home from home with them you know whether I was staying over or whether we were training together it was just like an extended it was an extended family and it still feels very much like that. And even across, even across some of those generations of, you know, how I developed from a junior badminton player right through. Even when I go online now and see people, it's just they're lifelong friends. Nothing's ever changed. You just pick, you just pick them up, pick up the conversation. Just like it's just you haven't seen them. You may not see them for three or four years, but it's just like you've never been away. Even though the, those tournaments from quite a few years back now. No, it's incredible, isn't it? Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Leslie Jewett, for talking badminton. My pleasure.